Good morning, friends. Good morning. Can I just uh, tip my hand to you a little bit and just show you a little bit of behind the scenes? There, there was a time in the past when Easter used to be so incredibly stressful for me. Uh, I, I, I have to be honest, like I hated it because, I, because I'm a pastor. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? And, past, and pastors hate Easter, in a, in a way. Because we and I, at the, in this time, like I was, I was putting so much pressure on myself. And, and I think you know what I mean here. It's a, I mean, it's a day when we have visitors, we have friends and family who are out of town. We're grateful that you're here. We're, we have visitors that are here this morning. We're glad that you're here. And, and this should be the day, if you're going to visit, this is the best day of the year. This is the day that we celebrate the risen Lord Jesus Christ. But I, I, was, I was caught in this trap of thinking, man, if I, like, if I do well, maybe people will come back again. And if I do, and if I, if I can just, if I can say something, if I can craft something, if I, if I can, I mean, I want, in my mind, I want to, to please, you know, all of these people. And as I'm thinking about you and as I'm praying for you and as I was preparing my heart and my, my mind over those years, you know, my heart, my heart cares deeply for you and for our church family and for the friends that we have this, here this morning. And I'm thinking, man, everybody's coming from different situations. And even some of the people that I've talked to this past week or this past month, I know there are some in this room that have struggled with, with suicidal thoughts this very week. I know there are some in our company who's marriages are just unraveling before them. And you're feeling like, man, what do I, I don't even know, how am I going to save this? Is it even salvageable? I don't know. I know there are some of you who are struggling with addiction. I know there are some of us in this room who are, who are wrestling through chronic pain, who are dealing with that and are just fatigued and are worn out. And, and in my mind, I'm, you know, I, I, I thought, I used to think, I just remember thinking, man, I just, I want everyone who is here, I want every single person who's here to come and then to leave having gotten something, like having received something, having been blessed by something and filled. Right? I want everyone to be pleased. And then it got me thinking, what is it that we're doing here this morning? What, what is it? Like, what is, what is all of this about? Right? Like, why, why do we do what we do? What is an Easter service? What's the point? What's it for? Is the goal that, that each one of us, that I would leave here, like, happy? Is the goal that we would come away, like, impressed or feeling these, like, good vibes of some sort? Is that what our hearts need most? Or is the resurrection true? And is the resurrection so true that there is a God who is alive? He rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead and because he left his church, he sent his spirit so that he could be present with his church when it gathers that there is a being in this room, present here, right now, with us, that we are gathered for to celebrate and to, to worship and to bless him. Is he the point? Isn't, isn't he what we're supposed to be all about, right? And I, and I wonder, but I wonder how many of us came this morning with, like, with that kind of mentality. Man, I can't wait to get there. He's going to be here. And I want this to be the best Easter ever for him in my life. I want to sing his praise. I want to just, I want to focus on him. I want to learn about him. I want to call on his name. I want to make him great in my life. I want to sing for the, at the top of my lungs because of what he's done and who he is to me. Like, did, did, we, come, did we come with that kind of mindset? I, I have to be honest. I struggle with this, right? Like, I don't often approach life. I don't often approach worship with that kind of mindset. I just, I tend to be a selfish person. We tend to be selfish people, right? And we, we tend to start with us first. And we tend to think, 
And we, we even kind of judge and we'll say like, yeah, that was a really good service. Or that wasn't, meh, I didn't really get a whole lot out of that. Or that sermon was just meh, which I, I know I preach a lot of those meh kind of sermons. We tend to, ha- we tend to have this kind of mindset that starts, it starts here, it starts small. And we, we start, we see the world from, just from within ourselves, right? From when, within our own little sphere, our own little circle. And this is how, really, this is how we go about a lot of life, where we tend to make a lot of, our, some of our biggest decisions, we tend to make a lot of decisions, asking the question, not asking the question, what would God want? What is God up to? What would he want in my life? We tend to start with the question, like, what, like if I do this, would God be okay with it? Right? If I, so, I'm, I'm buying a house, or I'm buying a car, I'm starting a career, I'm making a decision about a spouse, a, you know, a potential future spouse, we tend to ask, would God be okay with, with this if I, if, I just, if I go this route? Rather than asking, rather than stopping and starting with, with this question, Lord, what do you want? What do you want here? What do you want in my life? What do you want with my career? What do you want when it comes to the way I spend my money? How should I, what kind of car ought I buy that would help me accomplish the mission of God in the world? What do you want, Lord? The passage that we're going to read this morning, it's a long passage from Luke chapter 24. In fact, if, you're, if you have a Bible, grab your Bible and go to Luke 24. If you're using a pew Bible, that's on page 884. I really, I would encourage you to uh, to get your eyes in Scripture, because I want you to be able to see some of what it is that we're going to be reading here and learning here. So Luke 24, page 884, in your pew Bibles there. We're going to read for a good while here. And, um, and if, or if you don't have a physical Bible, um, just use one of your devices there. But the passage that we're reading here sets us up in this direction where it forces us to ask the question, where are you starting? What expectations are you starting with? When you're asking these questions, the most important questions in life, from what is, are you based? You know, out of what are you based? And, and, and where, where do you form your expectations? So read with me Luke chapter 24. Let's start with verse 1. We'll go all the way through to verse 48. But on the first day of the week, At early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. This is just in the chapter before we learned that the women had prepared these spices. Taking the spices that they had prepared, verse 2. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened... And bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and the mother of James and the other women with them who, had, who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. They did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping, in, uh, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. And then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these last days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. 
And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But when he had hoped that he was the one, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they'd even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of these who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said to them. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, when he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. And then they, then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it before them. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And we'll stop there this morning. So, Hilltown, one, one of the fascinating things about this passage is that Luke, who wrote the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, this is the gospel, the story of Jesus' life, according to Luke, this doctor, uh, this first century historian who was, who was charged by, we believe, a man named Theophilus. He was charged by Theophilus to write this historical account. Luke wrote another book just after this. It's the book of Acts. And Acts picks up where Luke leaves off. And, and here's the fascinating thing. In the first chapter of Acts, if you read that, you'll see there are 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension into heaven. And in the book of Acts, Luke's, Luke shows, he knows everything that happened during those 40 days. I mean, he, Luke himself was like a historian, like a good historian. He went around and got, got eyewitness accounts from a whole bunch of different people. And so he knew all about those 40 days that Jesus spent teaching after the resurrection. He knew all about Jesus appearing to a whole lot of people. He knew all about Jesus performing miracle after miracle and proving his resurrection and proving his power over life and his power over death and, and proving that to so many different people. But here, in this passage, Luke chooses to wrap up his most important historical account with just these three stories. The women at the tomb, the road to Emmaus, and then him appearing to his disciples in the upper room. Just these three he chooses. There's something about these three. Why He's, he's convinced that these three say everything that needs to be said 
in order to adequately capture and communicate about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the reaction of his followers, his disciples. And the common theme that we're going to see is that they had fixed expectations. And there were even reasonable expectations. And those expectations caused them not to see, not to be able to see what they so desperately wanted to see and needed to see. Their expectations were were actually blinding them in a very real, very powerful way. So we're going to, we're going to, in all three of these stories, we're only going to look at one of them, but on all three story, stories, the same pattern emerges. So kind of catch this. If you think back of, of, on what we just read, we see that they're confounded. They've got confounded expectations, and then they're confronted in love, and then they're convinced by God's word, and then they're compelled to share. In all three stories, that same pattern kind of rises out of this. They are, they're confounded expectations. Their their expectations are confounded, right? They're confronted in love. They are convinced by God's word. And then they're compelled to share, to go and to tell other people about what they have discovered. But for us today, we're going to focus on this middle story. Because, for one, it's it's the one that Luke spends the most time on here. But it's also, I think, the most relatable to a lot of us today. So we'll talk about the road to Emmaus. Let's take a look. Number one, confounded expectations. Confounded expectations. So it's Sunday afternoon. That Sunday afternoon, Cleopas and his friend, they exit Jerusalem's western gate. They're heading toward Emmaus, and they're walking away from it all. I mean, think about what's physically and even emotionally happening at this point. They're walking away from it. They're walking away from the other disciples, away from where they last saw Jesus. And they're consumed in thought. They're deep in conversation, so much so that somebody passing by could see that, man, this is intense. Whatever they're talking about is, is intense. They're embroiled in this conversation, right? And you know, you know what's so wonderful about this, this moment? These two disciples, Cleopas and, and his friend, these two disciples are not part of the 12. They're not one of the insiders, right? They've never been mentioned before in the book of Luke. They'll never be mentioned again in the book of Acts after this. In other words, they seem like a couple of nobodies. And yet here, on the very same day that our Lord rose from the dead of all the places that he could go, of all the people that he had to appear to and wanted to talk to. I mean, here he he conquers the effects of sin and death. He's defeated Satan, the enemy, right? He He deserves to go on this, like, triumphant victory lap around Jerusalem. But, but what does he do? He finds these two seeming nobodies walking away, discouraged and dejected. And he comes after them. And he asks these questions that, that are going to kind of draw out their hearts. I mean, these are rhetorical questions. They're kind of like counseling questions, right? He already knows the answer to these questions. He just wants to hear them process it. He wants to give them an opportunity and draw them out to hear how they're responding, how they're thinking about all of the things that have happened. So he plays dumb in order to hear their heart. And it's, I, honestly, that, just that point in itself is such an encouragement to me. And I would hope that it would be an encouragement to you that he comes after the nobodies, right? He comes after us even when we're doubting, even when we are struggling in our faith. He doesn't say, like, what, you, you doubt, really? You doubt me? You doubt the scriptures? Pfft, fine, I've had enough of you. You've had your chance, right? He doesn't, he doesn't do that with them. He goes after them, and he lovingly takes time and walks alongside of them. And this probably took hours of this very first day, this important day. Right? He's not offended by their lack of understanding, but pursues them. So how are they processing these things? It says they were just, they were crushed. They didn't know how to respond. So they're just standing there. It says, it says, looking sad. And when Jesus asks again, they say in verse 19, they explain, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, 
our chief priests, like our, get this, right? Our spiritual leaders, the people who are supposed to be like vying for us and, and caring for us, shepherding us, nurturing us, our chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. And here, and here is really, this next verse is really the key to understanding their hearts. It's one of the most irony-laden statements in all of the Gospels. Look, all of this, they say, all of this happened, verse 21, all of this happened, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Right? All of these things happened this past week. All of this happened, but our expectations were crushed. But we had hoped, we had thought that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. He, we thought he was going to be the Savior. Friends, enter just for, do your best to enter into their world for just a, a few minutes here. You know, so, so put yourself back. It's, it's the day of the resurrection, first century Israel. Exactly one week ago, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey, which, which seems like a, a super quirky thing for anybody, any one of us Americans here today. But to someone who is a first century Israelite, a Jewish person, a Jewish believer, this was deeply symbolic. Because whenever a king rode into a, whenever a king would come into a city, he would ride. Whenever he would ride on in victory, like to conquer, he would come on a steed. If he came in peace and humility, he would ride on a donkey. So this was very symbolic. And then not only that, but King Solomon did this very thing thousands of years ago. And then Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says that the Messiah himself will ride in when he goes to take the city. And so now on top of that, right, so they're expecting, they see Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, and they're thinking, all right, this is, like, we've got to stop. This is, this is happening. I can't believe this is happening. So on top of that, yet another dynamic. What, what week is this? This is, this is holy, the Holy Week that they're preparing for, right? This is the week of Passover. It's the week when Israel celebrates that God passed over them in Egypt. Now, now, if you don't know the Old Testament, let me just take you back here for just a moment. It's the week when Israel was, they were, they were in bondage, in slavery to Egypt, this is the moment that defined who Israel was because God says, listen, sacrifice a lamb, mark the door of your house with the blood of that lamb. When I see that mark, I will pass over. And I, but everything, I'm going to judge the land. I'm going to judge everybody except for those who are marked by the blood of the lamb. And when that happened, it secured Israel's freedom because Egypt, when, when Egypt went through that, when judgment hit Egypt, Egypt said, you get out of here. You are free to go. And Israel, for the first time, became a free nation. And they were a full nation. They were God's people, redeemed and set free from slavery. And so think about this. Here they are. They're celebrating the Passover. They're celebrating what made Israel a free people, what made Israel free from bondage. And yet they're, right now, they're currently under Roman occupation. This miserable occupation. And they're, they're celebrating freedom. Historians tell us that the tension in Jerusalem would escalate every year at this time, the tension in Jerusalem would, would escalate. It would be like a powder cake. It would be like a, a beehive, just buzzing with activity. And so Rome would actually send extra soldiers into the city because they knew if there's ever going to be a revolt, it's going to happen in this week. If there's ever going to be some kind of rebellion, some kind of rising of power, this is when the Jewish people would do it. And so they send extra soldiers. And those extra soldiers, of course, would put everybody on edge. Everybody would, like, everything would be heightened, right? Everybody was walking on eggshells. And so, so they see Jesus ride into Jerusalem on a colt, a young donkey, and they think, like, oh, man, this is it, right? Like, this, this is happening. They, and they knew history is being forged right here, right now. These things are, are, are happening. This is huge, right? And so now, take that understanding. Now, Fast forward a week, and their liberating Messiah is dead. You see, the term even, Messiah, the term, the idea of, of the Messiah means God's 
chosen one, his anointed one. In other words, he, of all people, the Messiah was supposed to be blessed. The Messiah was supposed to be protected. The the Messiah was supposed to be pleasing to God. He was God's chosen one. He was the one who God said, yes, you're my guy. And they all thought he was going to be the Messiah. He was not supposed to be abandoned by God. He was not supposed to be crushed by God. He was not supposed to be left alone by God to die. But but that's what Friday was. That's what the cross was. So when any God-fearing Jewish believer saw Jesus, who they thought was the Messiah, hanging on a cross on Friday, that moment would have completely changed their mind because they could not reconcile God's chosen one with that bloody, awful sacrifice. They couldn't make sense of that. An instrument of shame like the cross was, an instrument of punishment, an instrument of death, they would have seen that and said, no way. Like he, mu- he must have been wrong. I can't believe I was so wrong. To believe in him, I'm, a, I'm such a fool. To have, to have put my hope in, in that guy and look at how he ends up. Like, and that's, like, really, he's gonna be, we're going to say he was the one who was chosen by God? That's embarrassing. That's, a, that's offensive. They, they couldn't make sense of this. And so that's, that's why they're walking away with their tail between their legs and their heads hanging, looking sad. And so when, when we understand this, it makes us think, okay, I, I get it. I, I see why they're thinking the way they're thinking. All of us have had these moments when we said, we've said to ourselves, man, if, if that ever happens in my life, that would be the worst, right? Or if that, if that had happened in the past, Man, that, that would have been the worst. Like, what, you know, if one, of my child, if one of my children dies, that would be the worst. Or could you imagine if the Nazis had won the world war and were the current dominant power in the world, that would be the worst, right? That's, I mean, that's, we've, we've had these thoughts. Do you understand? So this, that very thing is happening for Christ's followers here and now in this passage. If Jesus is killed... That would be the worst. If anybody, if if the man who could raise people from the dead, if he couldn't even get himself off the cross, if he couldn't get himself out of this punishment, if he couldn't, I mean, he was so good when he was debating with the religious leaders and other people in the temple, but here he went on trial and he couldn't even stand up for himself. He just loses his spine. I mean, how could he possibly, right? This, This is... This is the worst. He can't figure out a way to conquer an enemy. We're done. He's not going to be any leader for us. We're done. This is is the worst. The worst that could possibly happen. So their their expectations are confounded. And we're confronted with this truth. Think about this. Anytime, anytime we have a false idea of who God is and who Jesus is, and what he promised to do, we will be disappointed. And, and I say this partly to challenge some of you, because some of you don't like the God of the Bible. Because your expectations are set in such a way, and you're starting at such a point that's centered on yourself. And you're saying, this is what I like. This is what I believe. This is what I would want in a God. And so you determine, now that's a God I could worship, or that's not a God I would ever want to follow. Anytime people have a false idea of who Jesus is and what he promised to do, we will be disappointed. We will be crushed, just like his followers here on this path. So, confounded expectations Two, confronted in love. So you can imagine these two bewildered disciples. They're, they're saying all this. They're, they're bearing their heart, right? They're visibly upset with this total stranger. They're not afraid to just say, yeah, this is how we feel. This stinks. We don't like this. 
right? They say, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And then they say in verse 21, yes. And besides all this, it is now the third day since all these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So they're, they're still they're processing this out loud, right? And then the stranger does something that they would not ex- have expected at all. He confronts them, and he says, verse 25, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? So can you imagine their astonishment in this moment? And can you, can you imagine, really, can you imagine the tension that was there on that path in this moment? You don't say something like this without looking that person eye to eye, right? Or like if the guy turns and says, you foolish people, like if, surely they're going to stop and look at him, square him up in the eye, right? So you could, you could just imagine the tension being so thick in this moment. All of a sudden, this stranger who just a moment ago seems totally clueless is calling them out, right? Now, it's important to see what he does say, it's, but it's important to see, it's important to think about what he does not say in this moment. He does not say, man, you guys, how slow you are to believe in the resurrection, right? He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't say, didn't the Christ have to be raised from the dead? Like, he doesn't talk about the resurrection in this moment, he pushes them, he pushes them further back, more elemental, more foundational than, than that. He doesn't say anything about the resurrection. What he's shocked by is that they didn't believe all that the prophets had said about the Christ. They did believe the prophets. I mean, they were faithful, God-fearing Jewish p- believers. They were looking for the Messiah, right? They did believe the prophets, they, but they did not believe all that the prophets said. They, they picked and chose what they wanted to believe. They chose things that suited them. They chose things that fit their worldview and their expectations. And the other stuff, they kind of just sifted out and left behind. Here's the problem that the road to Emmaus points out, the problem with our hearts. We tend to want the Savior that we want. If at the center of all of our rejoicing is us, right, like we were saying at the beginning of this sermon, if if what we get excited about is not who God is and what he is up to in the world, but what he does for me and how he makes me feel and what he's accomplished in my life, and what he can do possibly for me, right? If, that, if that's our center, if that's our starting point, we're just, we're just as much in danger of missing the, like the beauty and the power of what is happening, what happened then for these two on the road to Emmaus, and what can happen in your life, even here this morning, when you consider these truths. God is up to something magnificent in the world. That is the center of the universe. He is the center of the universe. We don't ask him to bend that around us. We fall in line around him, and that's where we find our greatest joy. Some, some of you here this morning, you're very comfortable kind of picking and choosing what you want in God. You're very comfortable kind of keeping your creator at a distance and just kind of taking things from the balcony. And that's what, what I love about this story on the road to Emmaus is, like Jesus, I mean, that, that's, that's such an impersonal way to approach God. It's such a, you're objectifying him to that degree. What I love about Emmaus is that Jesus says, no, I'm not going to have anything to do with that. I'm going to get right up in your face because I love you. I can't let you leave with this kind of perspective. You're going you're gonna to be worse off if this is how I leave you. I need to enter. I'm, I'm going to pursue you. I love you. I'm going to chase you down. I'm going to talk with you. I'm going to confront you. He's not satisfied 
not to be known. He's not satisfied to, to let them go, right? He wanted them to know. He wants you to know who he is, how much he loves you, and what he's doing in the world, and invite you to be a part of it. So just a, so ask yourself, what kind of Messiah, what kind of king, what kind of savior, what kind of God are you looking for? Why are you here this morning? Why did you come? And what's going to be on your lips when you leave? So confounded by reality, confronted in love, convinced by God's word. Firm rebuke turns into this loving instruction. Read this again with me, verse 26. He says, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And he probably, you know, the, this, Emmaus is about seven miles from Jerusalem, so if he caught up with them somewhere toward the beginning of this journey, it was probably about a two, two and a half hour trek until they got to Emmaus itself. And so he, he probably filled those hours with instruction on, on all the ways in which the Old Testament points ahead toward Jesus Christ. I heard this great illustration uh, from, you know, from a gentleman who was at a conference down in South America. He was saying, you know, he, we went to this conference. It was a pastor's conference being held in Quito, Ecuador. And he said, all along the way, we started in this one village, and we had this old rickety bus, and we were going to take this bus and go to, from village to village to village and pick up pastors on the way to this pastor's conference that was being held in Quito, Ecuador. And he said, the cool thing was, you know, as we're getting, as we're gathering all these people, as we're, you know, we're stopping the bus, we're getting meals, we're stopping the bus, we're gathering people, all along the way, you could see signposts that were pointing to Quito, Ecuador, right? But, but he said, you know, the, the entire thing, the trip wasn't necessarily about, the bus, the bus ride wasn't about Ecuador. It wasn't, it wasn't about the pastor's conference. It wasn't about Quito, but there was evidence of it. There were these road signs pointing. There was, there was conversation that was kind of sprinkled all throughout, all along the way. Everything was moving in that direction. And if anybody was paying attention, you wouldn't have to ask, hey, where's this heading? Where's this bus heading? You would know. You would see it on the signs. You would hear it in the conversation. You would see evidence that th this trip is landing and centering on Quito, Ecuador. And, and in a way, the Old Testament is like that, where all through the Old Testament, every story whispers his name. You see the Messiah. You, 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 you see him revealed through different characters that come out. You see him revealed through his law that is given. I mean, think about the law, the, the law, the book of Leviticus that talks about the priesthood. It talks about the sacrifices. The Jesus, I can imagine Jesus opening this up for them and saying, you need a priest, and I'm the priest. You needed a sacrifice, and I am the sacrifice, right? And he showed how the Passover lamb pointed to him, the spotless sacrifice whose blood we need to be marked by in order for judgment to pass over us, in order for grace to come into our lives, in order for us to be freed from bondage, freed from slavery. And then how all the prophets pointed to him. I mean, I could, we could go on. You could think of the passage that Kelly read earlier from Isaiah 53. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our sins. By his wounds, we are healed. All of these prophecies, all of these things, Jesus was opening up for them and showing. Do you, like, do you see it? How all of this all of it, even the bad stuff, even the pain, even the suffering that he had to go through, all of it pointed to him. 2,000 prophecies like this have been permanently preserved in the Hebrew Scriptures, all of them pointing to just one man, which, which gives me so much confidence when you see, like, when, when you think about, like, is Jesus really who he said he was? Did he actually, did he do it? Like, did he fulfill the prophecies the way they said they would be? When you look at these ancient texts, which we know are ancient because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we know that they came from before Christ. Any, any historian would tell you, yes, they're valid. And when you see the, the prophecies, all of these prophecies fulfilled in just one man, it, it just gives me so much confidence in who he is and how he ended up being who he said he would be. So for hours, he draws this out for them. And as he did, the fire of their faith that had been all but snuffed out on Golgotha 
came back to life, right, and burned with that familiar hope, the hope that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the chosen one. Could it really be true? Like, was Jesus suffering for them? Jesus raised from the dead? If, if it's true, then everything that they believed about the Messiah, that he was the chosen one, that he was protected, that God was pleased with him, if he raised from the dead, if God raised him from the dead, then it would confirm God was pleased with him. It would also confirm that he didn't die for his own sins. What did he die for? He died for ours. If all of the prophecies were true, you could, I mean, you could kind of, in a, in a way, just imagine their wheels turning and for them to be like pieces coming back together and their hearts just burning, as they say here. But then they're asking, who is this dude who so beautifully makes sense of all of these things that ever happened, right? But seems so clueless. There's just something about him. And then as soon as they see him, whether it's in the breaking of the bread, reminding them of Jesus breaking bread, the many times that he did, whether it's breaking the bread, them seeing his hands scarred by the nails, we don't know how, but they saw, they got a glimpse and they recognized, it's you. And then he disappears. Now, why do you think these guys were kept from recognizing, that's what it says, kept from recognizing Jesus for hours. I think the clue is in verse 25. And I I, kind of want to end with this, so think deeply about this. Jesus said, they were slow of heart to believe the scriptures. In other words, their outward ability to recognize Jesus was a reflection of their inward condition, their inward unbelief of what the scriptures had said about him. Jesus had every intention to help them see that day, right? He wasn't there to just play games with them. But before he would open their physical eyes, he was determined to open their spiritual eyes. And the means that he uses to do that was God's word, his written revelation about who he is. When you, when you think about just that fact, right, he, you, you, you understand, he wanted to show them that the first proof, the primary proof that you and I have to believe is actually him revealing himself through his word, not primarily, not him revealing himself physically. I, when I think about this, when I think about what this means, what this meant for, for them, how encouraging this was for them, how encouraging it must be and, and has been for, for generations to come, for all of us, right? Because it was so important they, that they would walk by faith and not by sight, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says. Like, do, you, do you see how encouraging this is to us? We don't, we don't get to see Jesus in person. In fact, he says to his believers, after he raises from the dead, he says, blessed are you who believe because you see, but more blessed are they who are going to believe though they don't see. They don't get the privilege. I'm, gonna, I'm leaving this place, and I'm leaving so that I'll send the Holy Spirit. And when I leave, it's going to be for your better. So, so when I send the Holy Spirit, it's actually going to, it's going to benefit you even, even greater that I'm going to be gone from you. And, and when I leave, other people aren't going to have the privilege. They're going to have the luxury of being able to see me face to face, being able to touch me, grab my hands, and stick their fingers in my side like Thomas did. They're not going to have this ability. But they have, you have everything you need to know who God is, what he's up to, and to believe. And I, I just, I love that he chose to reveal himself to his followers in this very way, in this order of things. That he would show them, he would open up the word, their hearts would burn, 
and they would get it. Their, their faith would be ignited simply because of what was revealed in Scripture thousands and thousands of years ago. If you're a believer here this morning, you need to hear this. Sometimes when we're discouraged as followers of Christ, we tend, right, like we, we tend to think God is not living up to our expectations. And we tend to feel distance. We tend to make ourselves distant. And sometimes we'll even say, God, if you're going to, really, if you're real, you've got to come after me. Right? You gotta, you've got to prove yourself to me. Do something to show that you are good. Right? Like, as, as if God needs to pander to us. And sometimes, the, you know, like sometimes the result is we lose, we just lose sight of him. But not being able to see him doesn't mean that he isn't there walking with us. Right? We may not recognize him, but those are not the times to neglect God's word. Those are the times to spend looking deeper into God's word, pushing harder into God's word. And that is where you'll recover your sight. Think about it in this way. When I was younger, I used to do a lot of backpacking. And uh, this was back before we had cell phones, before we had GPS. And so we had these big pieces of paper called maps, right, that we, would, that we would unfold and kind of turn around and try to figure out, like, which one, like, which mountain is that one that we're looking at, and which river is this, and which side of it are we on. And uh, there was a night that some friends of mine and I decided to hike this one trail, I've told some of you about this before, called the Black Forest Trail in upper central Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful trail. And I think it's a 52-mile loop, and we decided we were going to try to break the record that had been hiked in 27 hours. We wanted to break it, and we wanted to hike it in 24 hours. So we started at 7 p.m. at night. And about three hours in, we had you know, the sun set, and we had our headlamps on, and we were looking down at the path in front of us. And I was thinking of this verse, Your word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I was thinking of the beauty of that passage. And, you know, in the past, I just thought, well, what a nice idea. And I, I kind of pictured like a, a lighthouse, <laughs> you know, just shining the way for, like, I'm going to, I can see for miles because of God's word. And that night, it, he, he showed me, no, I'm just, I'm going to show you the one next faithful step, right? And a few hours into our trip, we were starting, we were looking up, we were looking around, and we realized we hadn't seen one of those little white hash marks, the paint marks on a tree in a while. And so we, we said, okay, well, we need to double back and figure out uh, where we may have lost the trail, if we lost the trail. Because the, what we were on was certainly a trail. It just wasn't, we didn't see any marks. So we went back, and we went back more, and we kept going back and back, to the point where we realized we've been, we've been hiking longer than we had been hiking before, and we still hadn't found the trail. In that moment, you, I mean, you tell me, when did we get to know the map of the Black Forest Trail best? Was it the week before? when we were just kind of casually giving it a glance and saying, yeah, this is where we're going to take a break, this is where we're going to get water, this is where we're going to... Or was it in that moment when we, were, when we were desperately thinking, we might not even find it back to our car, let alone make it through the, the loop? When the trail was obvious, we didn't need the map, we didn't feel like we needed the map, but when the trail was tricky, or when there was no trail at all, you better believe we dug into that map and, and memorized that thing by the end of the trip. We did make it, by the way. We made it in 21 hours, so yay us. Um, <laughs> if you're not a believer and you're here this morning, I want to caution you. Don't make God 
pander to you and prove himself to you when he already has. Think about this. The God of the universe went out of his way and wrote a book, and he preserved it for generations after generations, and he gave it to you. And you have a copy of it in your hand right now. And if you don't own a copy of it, take one of ours. It'll be our gift to you, please. But dig into God's word and, and watch and see and find how faithful he is and how often he comes through. Because he is who he promised to be, and he meets our expectations. Now, if I could just add this, this fourth as just a closing thought. Every time in these stories, every time this progression happened, where there was confounded expectations, they were confronted in love, they were convinced by God's word, the next step was they were compelled to share. They could not help but get this out. They had to tell somebody, look what God's done. Look what Jesus has done. Right? Look how he conquered the grave. If Jesus did, in fact, conquer the grave, that means he was the Messiah. That means he was and is the king. That means he is the creator. And if that's the truth, then my life no longer centers around me. I don't have to define reality for myself. I don't have to find my direction anymore. He is it, and my life gets to revolve around him. And so that, that truth, they realized that truth was just incredibly freeing. Now we know the point. Now we know. When I go to make a decision, like, what, sh what house should I buy? What car should I buy? What career should I undertake? What should I do with my life? Who should I marry? What, any, any major decision, any, any minor decision, you start with, who is God? What is he up to? What, he, what would he want from my life? It's, it's one of the most freeing and reorienting truths to ever strike the human heart. And, it, and it's sealed, it's confirmed because of the resurrection. This is why, 300 years from now, the Roman Empire would be defunct and Christianity would be spreading like wildfire across the Western world. This is why. Because you couldn't stop these people from simply saying, this happened. So Hilltown, I want you to be encouraged. Be encouraged by and be inspired by what it is that you hold in your hand. And for those of you who are visiting this morning, I want you to be challenged, lovingly challenged. Take a good look at who God claims to be based on the truth from his word. And if you're interested in finding out what, like, just what he does claim to be, I would love to talk to you about that. Any of our elders would love to talk to you about that. We're wearing these yellow lanyards today, the elders are. So, so if you have a question, come and grab one of us. Come and find one of us. We would love to talk and pray with you. Will you pray with me now? Our Lord, we, we praise you because of not just who you said you would be, but, but the fact that you actually pulled through and did everything that you said you would do. Lord, we don't, we don't deserve to be, a, to be those who get to hear and understand what it is that you're about, what it is that you've accomplished. But Lord, it's by your grace that you've revealed these things to us through your word and through your son in these last days. And so, we, we, Lord, we praise you. We, just, we lift grateful hearts to you. And it's you, Lord. It's you that we want to sing praises to on this day. It's you that we want to make much of this day. It's you that we want to come away impressed by on this day, of all days, and this Easter Sunday. We pray this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.